42% of those interviewed had to go to the emergency room for their valley fever, and 40% were hospitalized overnight. It was 104 when we took my temperature. I called my doctor, and of course, he wasn't there because it was a weekend. They finally tracked him down, um, and he said, go to urgent care or the emergency room. Go to either one. But it took a trip to her second trip to the emergency room to for them to get to the point where they admitted her and started all the testing and doing the CT scans and sending the blood to California and stuff like that. By the time they came to look at me, I had a fever of like almost 103. So at that point, uh, my daughter said, Dad, we're taking you to the emergency room. <laughs> we're not gonna wait. The emergency room became my best friend. More than $64 million were spent on Valley Fever hospitalizations in 2006 alone. That's over $50,000 per hospital visit. We've learned that more than half of people with Valley Fever receive unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions that do not treat Valley Fever. So they started immediately training me you know, with antibiotics for the pneumonia. I probably did about five tries at antibiotics. He had a number of antibiotics. Antibacterial medication is ineffective for valley fever, which is caused by a fungus, not bacteria. 60% of people were eventually treated with antifungal drugs. Primarily, he was on amphotericin and um, amphoterable, as the, as the nurses said. My pulmonologist told me I needed to take antifungal for about six months. From there, you just go to Diflucan, which is extremely strong medicine, made me sick once again. The very first shot I had, it, when they stuck it back here in the back of my neck, I could feel hotness, really hot, going all the way down, all the way down to my toes. I mean, I radiated. And, and then I got really sick to my stomach. It seemed like it was getting worse and worse and worse, and finally Palestine said, boy, we're going to have to... Uh, put in an Elmira reservoir so we can do, um, you know, injections of amphotericin B. And um, I, I could explain it and show you. I have one right here. And that, that's, that's, you know, for basically chemotherapy into your brain. It's got a catheter that runs in your brain. They inject the amphotericin into this and then you pump it and it shoots it right into your brain cerebral spinal system. Just over half of people diagnosed with valley fever had ever heard of the disease before they were diagnosed. I, I think I'd probably heard of it, but I didn't know anything about it. It was a common cold. You, you get it, it and it goes away. I never really paid I never that much attention it was to this, it. Why would I get something like that? Yeah. I mean, I did, it's, it's just, it's like getting a newspaper, you know, who cares? Never had known anyone to have it. Didn't really know a whole lot about it, had heard about it. I truly thought it was something that people that here got that lived in the valley um, and it was more just a cold type symptom. I was told, well, everybody gets it, but most people don't even know they've ever had it. So valley fever to me was like a, a cold. You know, you get it and you get over it and that's it. Most heard about it from someone they knew, usually someone else who had valley fever. Talk to people about valley fever and a lot of times they say, oh, it's no big deal, I had it. Well, the only reason I knew is because my one of my good friends, her dog, always coughed. And I didn't know what it was. And her dog had valley fever, but that was like the only time I'd ever heard of it. Research shows valley fever is not contagious, person to person or animal to person. I, I understood that you could get it from spores in the air. Um, but I had no, I did not know the, the full ramifications of valley fever. About one in five people who had valley fever still did not know how you get the disease. And that was after their diagnosis. There's rarely anything in the paper. There's rarely ever anything in the news, on the TV. And so people don't perceive it as a serious illness. Three quarters of the people who were employed at the time of their diagnosis missed over a month of work due to the disease. I missed almost a month of work. I had to leave the job. I, I took an early retirement. And I didn't plan to retire at age 60. I planned to work till I was 67. For, for a number of years, um, you know, I was unable to work. I was, you know, a lot of time, you know, I had stents where I 
spent, I don't know, six months at least on amphotericin injections every morning at the hospital and then wearing a port and, getting, and taking them intravenously all day long at home. So you really couldn't do much during that time. So. Yeah. The majority told us valley fever interfered with their daily activities, and this continued for an average of three months. I'm not thinking about traveling. I would normally be thinking about traveling next summer. I'm not thinking about traveling. I really want to, uh, I really feel like I need some, the rest and, and uh, I need to build myself back. I was, you know, a fairly accomplished golfer. You know, I won five state championships in Arizona you know, the state amateurs, stroke play, match play, three, four ball championships, and a lot of national tournaments also. So, um, you know, I still enjoy golf, but I'm not nearly as competitive as I used to be. And it really was very, very hard, not only on me, it was hard on my family. I mean, luckily my daughter was young enough not really to know or to notice too much about it, but there were a lot of things that we didn't do because I never had the energy. And then I would be sick from the medicine. Valley fever is not like getting a cold. It affects people for a long, long time. I, mean, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. And nobody in their right mind would be in a bed for two years. Even if you were on disability, most people can do something. I can't do anything. It took away all of my manlyhood. It, it made me depend on other people when I really have no business depending on other people. Nobody wants to depend on another person. They want to be independent. We have learned that people diagnosed with valley fever lived in Arizona an average of 17 years before they were diagnosed with valley fever. Been in Arizona only about a little over two and a half years. I've lived here for seven years. 11 years. I grew up here. I never really had, have heard, had heard about valley fever at all. And uh, my first experience with, was with, with my daughter. So it's a myth that only people who just moved here get valley fever. People are not the only victims of valley fever. Besides humans, dogs, cats, zoo animals, and exotic pets can get valley fever. You know, I think a lot of people have, aren't, you know, have no, um, awareness of it. So I don't think they have any thoughts on it. Um, certainly, if you were to mention it to me and I didn't know anything about it, I would think, okay, you get a fever, you're sick, and then you get, you know, you get better. It's just like anything else. Dogs are the most common pets to become infected with valley fever. So of course I grabbed her, rushed her into the emergency clinic and um, they knew enough to, one of the things that they did was screen her for valley fever and they, um, it came back positive. The disease in dogs is similar to the disease in people. He didn't say it, he just said you don't have cancer. And I didn't really know until I started on the internet studying valley fever when my dog passed away. And then I thought, wow, that's what was wrong with me. We spend over $6 million each year diagnosing and treating valley fever in dogs. Diflucan was more expensive, but uh, we went to that, and we also decided to switch to a, a specialist internist veterinarian, at which point things started getting very expensive. And most people don't have any pet insurance. Treatment is an out-of-pocket expense.